I would like to thank the College Board for inviting me to give this lecture on radioactivity and half-life. Uh, this will more, be more like a conceptual understanding of these issues. So let's begin. So let's begin radioactivity. What does it mean? Well, a radioact uh, radioactivity, we have, if we have a radioactive substance, what that means is that the substance is emitting invisible stuff. Now, how do we know that it's emitting in invisible stuff? Well, the radiation can do harm. It can cause medical problems. It can, it can cause um, you to have internal problems. But the radiation can also be, over the years, people have harnessed it and they can use it for useful purposes as well, such as providing energy and, and um, you know, doing medical diagnostics and things of that type. But as scientists, what we want to do is we want to be able to study this invisible stuff. So what we need to do is be able to visualize it and be able to see it. Fortunately, someone invented what is called a cloud chamber. A cloud chamber is a, is a sealed container that has uh, particles in that that if you hit those particles with energetic uh, substance, the particles will create a little spark. If it creates a little spark, then you can, you'll be able to see where the spark occurs. And as the radiation travels through the cloud chamber, it will um, spark and cause a, a path, and you can see the path of the spark. So, so for example, here comes the radiation, it comes in, it hits one of the molecules, create a spark, and we can see the path. So this is a very useful method to visualize the radiation. With that in mind, we can create an experiment to study this invisible stuff. And for example, we, when we create an experiment, we always wanted to ask a question. So here's the question we can ask, is the radiation charged? Does it have a charge? Well, we can use our cloud chamber and since you have just, um, I believe in the AP Physics 2 course, you have done magnetism. Therefore, we can put a magnetic field on the cloud chamber, such as this. And if we send the radiation through the magnetic field, if, it, it will, if it's charged, it will be able to feel a force and, gets, and get deflected. So for example, here is a radioactive substance emitting radiation. If this one goes straight through, then we can say that it is not charged. Here's another substance hitting another type of radiation. If this one curves like this, we can say that it has a charge. As a matter of fact, we can do more than say that it has a charge depending on how much it curves. That means that the greater it curves, the more force it feels. We can say that it has more charge. So these are the types of um, experiments that people can do to study these radiation. And over the years, they have done many experiments and determined the, the different types of uh, substances, this invisible stuff being given out. So I made a table of the common type of radiation that uh, people have discovered. In the beginning, they did not know what these radiation were. So they called them things like alpha particle, here, beta particle, these are just the, the beginning letters of the Greek alphabet. They did not know what they, what they were, so they just gave them these, these names, gamma particle. But after doing these types of experiments, they were able to determine, for example, that the alpha particle was positively charged with a plus two E charge. It has a large mass. They were able to determine that the beta particle was negatively charged with a small mass. And today, we know the alpha particle to be the helium nucleus made up of two neutrons and two protons. We know the beta particle to be the same as an electron. They also discovered other things coming out of the um, radioactive substance. They found another particle identical to the electron, but positively charged. And they call that a positron, which we, we now know today to be an anti-electron. The gamma particle, did not have any charge, did not have any mass, 
And later on, we discovered that it was indeed a photon of electromagnetic radiation. Other things such as the neutrino was discovered. These are other particles coming out of the radiation. And these are just some of the common types. They have, they have discovered um, many more since then. And, and this is what, um, these are the initial stuff that people have discovered. However, today is not, I don't really want to give you a lot of information and facts. I just wanted to, to get more conceptual about what the radiation is about. So for example, one of the questions we can ask is, where does the radiation come from inside the substance? Well, I have drawn a little picture image here that, that uh, I have uh, exaggerated the atoms that are in the substance to be very large, here's an atom. And inside the atom, there's a nucleus. It turns out that the radiation originates from the nucleus, such as this one coming out of the nucleus here. And as you, and as you look through all the different nuclei, you'll see radiation coming out, coming out of all these nuclei. But it turns out that the radiation doesn't come from every single nuclei in the object, only certain ones. And um, we will see why later, why it only comes from certain ones. And, but the origin of the radiation is from the nucleus of, of the atom. We can still ask more questions. What, for example, we know the, the radiation comes from the nucleus. The question now is, what causes a nucleus to emit radiation? Why would a nucleus emit radiation? Well, the short answer is that the nucleus is unstable. So that's a big word, unstable. Now the question now is, what is, what is the meaning of the word unstable? So I'd like to, to, do, to go to a little, little thing now to try to understand the meaning of stability in physics. Because that is the, that's really what causes the nucleus to emit radiation is that it is unstable. But what does unstable mean? So let me give you a two, two common things. Here's, a, here's an object hanging from a ceiling. Would you consider this object hanging from a ceiling to be stable? L let's assume that the string is very, is very uh, strong, so it, it's not gonna break. Would you consider this to be stable? Well, it looks like it's not gonna go anywhere, so it looks pretty, pretty stable. So I would say, check, it's stable. But let's consider another common thing. Let's, here's a table with a ruler sticking off the edge. Would you consider that to be stable? Well, it looks a little precarious. If you push the ruler a little bit, it's gonna fall over and it's, um, it's not very stable. So I would say that is not stable. Now the question is, what distinguishes something that is stable from something that is not stable? Is it, is it equilibrium? So let's look at that. So let's consider the object over here on the string. Is that in equilibrium? Well, the answer is yes, because the string force will cancel the gravitational force and the object is in equilibrium. What about the, the ruler over here? Is that in equilibrium? Well, the answer is yes. The normal force cancels the uh, gravitational force and it's also in equilibrium. So both objects are in equilibrium, even though one is stable and one is not stable. So I would, I would click and say, yes, they are both in equilibrium. So we can say that something is unstable and, by, and define it to be not in equilibrium. So they, something can be unstable like this ruler and also be in equilibrium. In, in physics or in engineering, they classify stable equilibrium and unstable equilibrium. So the question then, then still remains, what is, what is the meaning of unstable? So let's, let's look at that. So I'm gonna give you a little definition and see if you agree with that. A system is stable if, when it is displaced a little from its configuration, it remains near this configuration. So let's see if that works. Let's go back a little bit. Well, here is the thing hanging on a string. If I were to push it a little bit, what's gonna happen? It's gonna swing back and forth 
but still remain near where it was originally. On the other hand, if I go to this ruler and I push it a little bit, it's gonna fall over on the floor and it's not going to be remain near where it was. So with that in mind, we can then say a system is in equilibrium is when it's displaced or moved out of its configuration a little bit, it remains near this configuration. And if it doesn't remain near this configuration, we say that it is unstable. So that is a fundamental meaning of stability that physicists use. Here's another question that we ha can have about stability. If something is, is unstable, like this table with the ruler, can it become stable? Well, the answer is yes. The ruler can be knocked off and you can go from this situation over here to this situation over here. And now it's stable when it's over here because it's resting on the floor, it is stable. So a system can go from being unstable to stable. When that happens, or maybe not stable, but maybe less unstable. When that happens, we say the system has decayed. So decay is a word in physics that describes something going from being unstable to be, being more stable. We say, that, we say that the system has decayed. Notice that the word decay is not being used as the regular English word here is using in a scientific setting. One feature of a, of a decay in going from a stable, uh, unstable to more stable, one feature is that the system goes into a lower internal energy. You'll notice that as the ruler falls to the ground here, there is less potential energy in the stable system as the ruler is now on the ground. Over here in the unstable system, it had more potential energy. So that's a feature of most, of most decays is that the system goes to a lower internal energy. So let's, let's further look at uh, decay. So here's a system, if this is gonna decay, the question now is what causes, what is it that allows it to go into a lower internal energy? Well, in order for a system to decay, in this case, it's the gravi gravitational force that's gonna cause the roll of the fall to the ground. So we say that the gravitational force is an internal mechanism that causes the system to decay. So in order for a system to decay, it has to have these internal mechanisms to cause a decay. What about a nucleus? Remember the radiation comes from the nucleus. So the nucleus is the one that is unstable. So it's the nucleus that is gonna decay. Well, let's look at a nucleus. Here's a typical nucleus. It has protons and I'll put the protons in the dark colors and it has neutrons, which is in the lighter color. So the question is, what is the internal mechanism within the nucleus that will cause it to decay? If the nucleus is unstable to go to a, a more stable configuration. Well, what are the internal forces inside of a, nucle a, a nucleus? Well, the protons are positively charged, so they are repelling each other. So we have an electrostatic interaction inside the nucleus. Is it possible that an electrostatic interaction inside the nucleus could cause the nucleus to decay? Well, the short answer there is no, because the electrostatic interaction would cause the protons to repel each other because they are both positively charged. So the electrostatic interaction is not gonna be able to, to keep the nucleus together because the protons are repelling each other electrostatically. So the electrostatic interaction cannot possibly cause stability, can it cause the, the nucleus to be more stable as, as it causes repulsion. It, it turns out that, well, he, he, here's a deeper question. If the protons are repelling each other, what keeps them together inside inside the nucleus. Well, it turns out that there is an additional force between protons and protons and protons and neutrons. And that force has to be stronger than the electrostatic repulsion in order to keep the protons together. The physicists have a very clever name for this uh, interaction that is stronger than the electrostatic interaction. They call that the strong interaction. 
So there's a, there's a strong interaction that is sort of attractive that is keeping the nucleus together. This is the interaction. This is one of the interactions that can be responsible for a nuclear decay. Similarly to how the gravitational interaction over here was responsible for the ruler decay. So the strong interaction is another interaction that occurs between protons and also between protons and neutrons and also between neutrons and neutrons. And that is a more of an attractive interaction. It turns out that there's another interaction within the nucleus that's called the weak interaction. I, I don't have, it, it's beyond our scope today to, to go into the details of the weak interaction, but suffice it to say that the weak interaction is another type of interaction between protons and neutrons and between neutrons and neutrons. But the difference between the weak interaction and the strong interaction is that the weak interaction also can involve electrons. Uh, I don't know if you remember when I gave you that table that one of the radiation was a beta particle that, that emits electrons from the nucleus. Well, here's the question. How can an electron come from a nucleus uh, as radiation? Well, it turns out that the weak interaction was, would be involved in, 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 in causing an electron to come out of, the out of the nucleus. Well, the deeper question is where does the electron come from? Well, I'll show you an example later to show you how we can get an electron out of, out of the nucleus. But anytime we have, we, we're having radiation that's a beta particle, electrons coming out of the nucleus, the, the weak interaction is what's, in, what's involved there. So these are some of the typical interactions inside of a nucleus that would cause, cause a decay. So, so let's look at some of the reasons why a nucleus will be unstable. One reason is that it has too many neutrons. It turns out that the balance or the ratio of protons to neutrons will cause the nucleus to be, it, it, there is an ideal ratio which causes stability. It, it's, it's not necessarily that they have to be even numbers or the same number of protons and the same number of neutrons. But if, if, the, if a nucleus has way too many neutrons, then it, it is unstable. Similarly, if it has way too many protons, it is also unstable. So here's another cause of instability. And also another cause of instability is that it's possible that the nucleus could have way too much energy. So it, it could be in an excited state and I, I want to get rid of some of that energy. So these are the three common causes of instability in, in, in a nucleus. Now I wanna talk a little bit more detail about decay. So <clears throat> here's a question. Suppose we have a system of identical systems, a whole bunch of systems of the same. Here's a fundamental question. Do they all decay at once? Would, if, when this falls to the ground, would they, this falls to the ground, would they all decay at once? Well, to understand if they're all gonna decay at once, we'll have to look at what triggers the decay. We know the, the internal interaction is what, what will cause the, the ruler to fall, but what would trigger that? Well, here's an example of a person walking in a room. If that person accidentally hits the table, then that would trigger a decay. Here's another example of a ceiling fan blowing air around the room that might push one of the, the uh, rulers to move and it would cause a decay. So the things that are gonna trigger the decay has to be things that like a person walking in this case of the table and a fan. So in other words, these, these are events that occurs randomly. So the mechanisms of decay may occur randomly. So if that's the case, the person might hit this table but not hit this table. The fan might blow this one, but not blow this one. So the short answer to, do they all decay at once? The answer is no, they don't all decay at once. It requires some internal mechanism to trigger the decay. Uh, and it's beyond our scope today to talk about what is the internal mechanism that will trigger a nuclear decay. We know that the internal mechanism that will trigger a table decay was a person walking around the room or a fan blowing air. 
But there are other things inside of a nucleus that would trigger that decay. That's beyond our scope today. But what we want to say is that if we have a whole bunch of, 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 of nuclei, they're not all going to, go, going to decay at once. So the question is, if they don't all decay at once, uh, how, how do they decay? How do they decay? How many decays in how much time? So we have a concept for that, and it's called the half-life. The half-life is a, is a, is a um, concept which is a measurable quantity. We can actually measure the half-life for the nuclei, and it's going to classify the rate of decay. It's, it's going to classify how many decay in how many amount of time. Because remember, they don't all decay at once. So the half-life is the time it takes for half of the number of nuclei to decay. So if we have a thousand nuclei, the time it takes for 500 of them to decay, that is what we will call the half-life. Let me give you an example of a half-life of a, of a nucleus. Here's a, let's say we have a carbon nucleus and the carbon nucleus has six protons and five neutrons. Now it, it has to have six protons because six protons is what defines a carbon nucleus. So instead of having to write six car carbons, six protons, and, and five neutrons. We have a symbol to represent this. And this is a symbol. C represents carbon. Six is the number of protons. And 11 is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So we'll call this nucleus carbon 11. Carbon 11 is unstable. It's an unstable nucleus. And it, the half-life, which I'm going to write as T subscript one half, is, a, is about 20 minutes. It takes 20 minutes for carbon 11, for half of the carbon 11 nuclei to decay. Let me give you some other examples. Boron 17. Boron has five, this, this nucleus has five protons and 12 neutrons. This one is also unstable and its half-life is five milliseconds. Here's another one, oxygen 19. Oxygen, eight protons, and uh, 11, this one would have 11 neutrons, so we'll get 19. That has a half-life of 28 seconds. Here's another one, silicon 32. That has a half-life of 170 years. So you can see there, there's a wide range of half-lives for all the different nuclei, even smaller than five milliseconds, even greater than 170 years. So what I wanna do now is to show you how people actually measure the half-life of a, of a nucleus. So I'm gonna simulate a decay. I'm gonna simulate a decay as a dice. So if I throw a dice and the dice comes up to be a number three, we will say that that dice, which represents the nucleus, does not decay. If the dice comes up to be a one, we would say that it has decayed. So if I throw a whole bunch of dice and whatever turns comes up one, number one, we will say those have decayed. The ones that do not come up number one, we say those have not decayed. Okay, so I don't have a bunch of dice, so I'm gonna to go to a website that has some dice, and it's the website random.org. So let me just show you that quickly. So here's the website, random.org. And if you go to, um, to games up here, to dice roller here, click on that, we can select, say, 60 dice is the most that they ever allow us to select. And we can get 60 dice here. So I have just thrown 60 dice, and how many of them have decayed? So we can say that these 60 dice represents 60 nuclei. Uh, how many of them have decayed? Well, we have a one here, another one that's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine of them have decayed. So if I started out with 60, 
and nine of them have decayed, I now have 51. So what I can do is I can go back and I can put in 51 dice and roll that, because that's what remains, 51, and I roll it again. And now you see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 now I've decayed. I think I got them all. So if I had 51 and 12 I've decayed, I now have 39 that's left. And I just can keep doing this, keep doing this until they all, or most of them have decayed. So I have done this ahead of time and I have some data. So let me show you. I have done that ahead of time. Here's the data that I've collected. In the beginning, a zero after zero throws, I had 60. The one that I did after the first throw, I had 46 left. After the second throw, I had 40 left and so on. And by the time I threw the dice 12 times, I only had three left. So this is a simulation of a, of a nuclear decay. So let me show you now. The question is, how do I get the half-life out of this data? Well, the thing that I would do to get the half-life out of this data, at first I have to graph, I would graph the data. So I used Excel and I graphed the data. And this is what I got. If I put the remaining dice on this side, if I play the remaining dice on this side and the throws and the number of throws that I do on this, this axis, you can see that I, after zero throws, I had 60. After one throw, I had 46 and two throws and so on. I'll get a nice, these are the, this is the data points that I've gotten. This type of function is, is an exponential function. It's exponential function. Because it's an exponential function, people refer to this as exponential decay. Now, the way we can get the half-life out of this exponential decay is to fit it to an exponential function. So I can use Excel and I can fit it to an exp to a exponential function. And here is the fit. And, then I, and it is, here is the equation of the fit. It's n, which represents the number of dice remaining, and t, which represents the number of throws. It's 60 e to the minus 0 0.239 times t. You notice that when t is 0, e to the 0 is 1, so n is 60. So that, that's this point up here. And that's because of the negative exponent, as t gets larger and larger, it will get smaller and smaller. It turns out that this exponential decay function, I can take it and I can determine the half-life from it. So let me show you how to do that. Calculate the half-life from the fit. So here's my function. N is equal to 60 e to the minus 0 0.239 times t. The way I'm going to determine the half-life from this is that I notice that when t is t to the 1 half, n would have to be 30. So in other words, when t is the half-life, the number remaining has to be half of what I started out with. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to substitute it into this equation. 30 is equal to 60 e to the minus 0 0.239 times t to the 1 half. And now I have an equation here where we can solve for t to the 1 half. It's a complicated equation, but it's solvable. The way I would solve this is that I first divide by 60 to get one half is equal to the e to the minus 0 0.239 t to one half. And to find a t to one half, I'll, I'll take the natural log of both sides. And I'll, when I take the natural log of the exponential, I just get the argument up here. So the natural log of one half is negative 0 0.239 t to the one half. And now I can solve for t to the one half by dividing by negative 0 0.239. So there we go. So what I did was the natural log of one half is the same as the natural log of one minus the natural log of two. And the natural log of one is zero. So the natural log of one half is negative natural log of two. 
and the negatives cancel when I divide, so I, I get this equation here. So when I compute natural log of two and divide it by 0.239, I get 2.90. So for the, nine, for the dice simulation, the, the, the half-life that I've gotten from this data is 2.90. Let's say if that makes sense in terms of the, uh, the data. Well, if you look at the data, the number of throws it takes to go from 60 to 30, you see it was from zero to it took three throws. So according to the data, the half-life is about three. And I'm getting with the, with the formal calculation 2.9. You see, if I go for another half-life from 30 to 15, which is here, 15, it's a two half lives is about somewhere between five and six. And two half lives of the, of the exact calculation is two times 2.9, which is 5.8. So you see that the, the, the uh, half life of 2.9 for the dice is making sense. So let me summarize this in general. So if I have an exponential decay, n is n naught, and naught is the initial amount e to the minus bt, so I have that exponential decay, then the half-life is just natural log of two divided by b. So that's a general equation for exponential decay. So what I wanna do now, in, in, if, if I think my time is running out, is to give you the, an actual nu nuclear decay. So let me look at the case where we have too many protons. <clears throat> In the case where we have too many protons, so here is a case, I'm gonna choose fluorine 18. Here's a case where we have too many protons. Uh, fluorine 18 would have nine neutrons and nine protons. Apparently nine and nine is in this case is, is too many protons. Um, what's gonna happen is in order for it to decay, the nucleus would want to, um, decrease the, the number of protons because it has too many protons. So what's gonna happen is that some of the energy that is within the nucleus is gonna be, is gonna be taken up by one of the protons and one of the protons is gonna, gonna sort of explode. It's sort of gonna change. So one of the protons is gonna take some of the energy that is in the nucleus and sort of, sort of ch change into three things. It's gonna explode into three things. A neutron and the E plus is, 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 a, is like an electron, but it's positively charged. Because the proton is positively charged, the stuff on this side also has to be positively charged. So it changes into a, a, a positive electron, which we call a positron. And it also gives off a neutrino. So it turns out that a proton can change into, a new, into three things, a neutron, a positron, and an antineutrino. Or uh, don't worry too much about this antineutrino. <clears throat> it turns out that when that happens, the nucleus would have decayed because the proton would have changed. And what happens is that the neutron that comes from the proton changing stays in the nucleus. So the protons, the neutron stays in the nucleus. But the other two things, the positron and the antineutrino, escapes the nucleus and it, that becomes the radiation. So what happens is that a proton would become a neutron and a, a beta particle and an antineutrino radiates from the nucleus. So here's a case of an actual decay of, of, a, of, a, of a nucleus. We can write a, an equation or a sort of like a chemical equation, but it's not really a chemical, a nuclear equation to signify this decay. We can say the fluorine 18 goes into, into oxygen 18. So why do we say it goes into oxygen 18? Well, it, we have lost the proton, so it went from nine to eight, but in, when we lost the proton, we have gained the neutron, so the number 18 doesn't change. So it goes from a, a nucleus with nine protons to a nucleus with eight protons. But a nucleus with eight protons has, uh, is, is, is oxygen. 
So this is an equation and the radiation then is these other two things here. So this is an actual thing. The reason why I chose this example is because the, the positron here has medical applications. People actually use fluorine 18 in, in, the, in medicine to get a positron coming out and the positron coming out can be used in, in, in diagnosing cancers, in diagnosing cancer. I won't go through the details, but people actually use fluorine 18 to get the positron to diagnose cancer. And that, that uh, technique is called positron emission tomography or PET, PET scan. I don't know if you've heard of the PET scan, but they actually use the fluorine 18. And the reason why they use fluorine 18 is because fluorine 18 has a half-life of a, about 110 minutes. You want to have a half-life of, of 110 minutes in medical applications, because if you create this unstable nucleus and it decays too quickly, then you don't have enough time to treat the patient. But if it decays too slowly, let's say it takes five, five hours to decay, you don't want the patient waiting around hours and hours for the, for the radiation to decay, because you don't want to send the patient out into the public emitting radiation. So you want the patient to wait enough half lives so that it's not, the patient is not emitting too much radiation. It turns out that 110 minutes is a perfect uh, uh, sort of a half-life for medical applications. So here's an actual nuclear decay. <clears throat> I believe that uh, it's about all my time today. So, so let me give you a summary. Radioactive substances emit radiation from unstable nuclei. So the idea here is that unstable. Now, as I said before, all nuclei in a substance don't have to be unstable. Uh, I don't know if you know the word for different number of neutrons for the same amount of protons, we call that an isotope. So if I give you a substance, say if I, if I dig from the earth and I dig up some uranium, it turns out that the uranium contains many different isotopes. Uh, some, some uranium nuclei could contain five more neutrons than some other uranium nucleus. So if that's the case, some of them are gonna be unstable and some of them are gonna be stable. But whichever ones that are unstable are the ones that are, that are emitting the radiation. Nuclei can be as unstable if they have too many neutrons or too many protons, among other things. The mechanisms of decay comes from the strong and weak internal interactions, but there is a probabilistic, underlying probabilistic mechanism so that they do not all decay at once and we then classify the rate of decay in terms of the half-life. The half-life can be measured by measuring the number of nuclear remaining versus time and fit to an exponential function. So these are some of the highlights that we have discussed today. And I hope that uh, you would have gained some, some information from this. So I wanna thank the College Board again, and thank you for this, uh, giving me the opportunity to give this lecture.